Good evening. It is good to be here tonight. Amen. Storm or no storm, the Lord is worthy of our worship. Amen. Forgive me here. I'm. I. I, I guess I use technology. Sometimes I feel like technology uses me. But uh, anyways. It is good to be here tonight. I was uh, honored when when uh, Jimmy called me a few weeks ago and asked if I'd come and, and preach this evening. And um, uh, you know, I, I know I never want to give up an opportunity to preach. I just enjoy uh, bringing the word of God. That's one of my favorite things to do. Of all the things that I get to do and have to do as a pastor, <laughs> uh, bringing the word of God is is absolutely my favorite. And uh, uh, when, when he told me it was going to be on prayer, I thought, man, I haven't preached on prayer a lot, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a systematic exposition guy, I mean, that I work through uh, books of the Bible. As a matter of fact, this past Sunday, I finished a series in 2 Corinthians, just preaching, you know, verse by verse through 2 Corinthians. There we go. All right. Well, I'm doing 2 Thessalonians next, so if you want to copy those sermons, I'll have them a few weeks ahead or anything, you know. Okay, well, hey, you never know, but... Uh, uh, and so I, I, uh, I address prayer, obviously, when it, when it comes up in that context. But, but you know, doing a one-off sermon, if you will, is, is a little different uh, for me. And, and so I had, to, you know, I had to pray extra hard about, you know, what passage do I want to use? Because I'm big on I want you to hear the Word of God. I don't want you to hear the Word of Joe Lemons because my Word ain't worth much. When I stand before God's people, I want to bring the Word of God. And my prayer is regularly, God, set me to the side and let your Word be prominent today. And so as I was looking through the, just some different verses, passages on prayer, the one I kind of landed on was James chapter 5. Now we're going to reference some other verses as well as we go, and, and I'm going to do my best to honor the time frame that I was given, although I was told that Michael Petty blew his time frame out of the water the other night. So as long as I'm less than him, I'll be okay. So uh, anyways, uh, but I, I, tonight I want us to look at James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, and then I will actually we'll sprinkle in a few other few other passages as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read God's Word, I will pray, and then we'll see what God has for us tonight. James chapter 5, starting with verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah, a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that, might, that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for, for the commitment of, of this body of believers to, to commit these three nights to, to, to focusing on prayer, to focusing on their, their communication and their, 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 their interaction with you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray that tonight, as we, Lord, as we approach your word, Lord, as always, I pray that your word would be prominent. Lord, I pray that we would hear from you tonight. And Lord, I pray that as we hear your word and Lord, as we understand it, Lord, I pray if our life is not in line with your word, Lord, that we would repent, Lord, and that we would let your word have its way in our lives, in our church, in our community. Lord, you are God. You alone are worthy of our worship. So have your way in this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So as, as I was just contemplating this, this idea of prayer, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I've heard in the past is if God is sovereign and He knows everything that is going to happen, and if, as the Bible says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning that God does not change, then why do we even need to pray? God knows what's going to happen. Um, we can't change God's mind through our prayers. So what is the point of even praying? Well, the, the short answer is, well, God said pray. It doesn't matter whether you, what you think about it or not. God said do it. But the bigger answer to me is, is, is this. We often want to try to look at things from God's perspective. We're not God. You know, there's a debate uh, that has been going on for years and years and will go on for years and years until we all get to heaven and God says it doesn't matter anyway over the process of salvation. 
you might hear it referred to as Calvinism on one end of the extreme, Arminianism on the other end of the extreme. You know the biggest problem with that whole debate? is people are trying to understand the process of salvation from God's point of view. And that's not our point of view. At the end of the day, does God know everyone who will be saved? Absolutely. Do I? Absolutely not. What's my call? To go and to share the good news. Amen? And so it's not up to me to be worried about that. It's up to me to be about the business of sharing the good news. We can argue about a lot of things that don't matter. And when we get to heaven, God will just, we say God who was right, he'll say, neither of you should be out sharing the gospel instead of arguing about that. But we can do that with prayer, too, where we can get so caught up into this idea that, well, God knows what's going to happen. What does it matter if I pray or not? And we're not God. At the end of the day, God has given us some instruction in prayer. One of the aspects of, of, of us praying is that we're supposed to pray in the good times and in the bad times, right? Whether, whether we're praising God for something good he has done or we're praying to God because a hurricane's coming. Amen? We're always supposed to be praying. This past Sunday morning at our church, we do a thing called intentional prayer time. It's, it's right after the first song. Uh, it used to be called opening prayer. We changed it to intentional prayer. And the purpose of that is during that time during the service, we have something that we are focused and intentionally praying about as a body, as a church. And with that, we're encouraged to pray about that through the week. So it's just some intentionality that we're trying to give to whatever topic God has burdened our church about. Obviously, this past Sunday morning, the focus should have been on the storm, right? I mean, because the hurricane's coming. We don't know where it's coming. We still don't know where it's going, right? I mean, anybody who tells you one thing, they probably are also telling you when God's coming back, and they don't know that either. But... um. When, when, we, when we look at this, when we, uh, when, when, anyways, we were getting ready for prayer time, and, and we were going to pray about the storm, and then I remembered that one of my church members asked if he could do the intentional prayer Sunday morning. And the reason he wanted to do that is that this church member, a number of years ago, was given a very severe cancer diagnosis. The kind that the response is often, how long have they given you to live? By the grace of God, last week, this gentleman received the final clearance that he is cancer-free. And he gives the glory to God, and he thanks the church for their prayers in that. And he wanted to have an intentional time of praise Sunday morning during that intentional prayer time. And he asked if he could just give the testimony, thank the church, and lead in prayer, which I had said yes. That was long before we knew a storm was going to be headed our way. But we went with it. And he got up, and he began to share, and he says, you know, what I've been learning in my Bible is that we're supposed to praise God in the good and in the bad. And so we praise God for a cancer-free report, and we praise God that he's going to carry us through the storm. Amen? Because whether it's good or bad, no matter what the situation is, we should pray to the God of the universe. Amen? Because God is God, and he knows. He knows where that storm's going to go. He knows where it's going to hit. We have no idea. I know what I'm praying for. <laughs> And, and God may answer that prayer, he may not, but he's still God regardless of what his answer is. So we've got to pray to God through the good and through the bad. Paul said, or excuse me, James said that right there at the beginning, or in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise. Praise is a form of prayer. I, I like, I, I'll tell you, um, I'm big on worship being focused to God and speaking either about God or to God. And, and sometimes our songs are songs of prayer. Sometimes I encourage our folks as we sing this next song, let this be the prayer of your heart to God. I think that that's a form of communication to God. But I'll also tell you another aspect of, of prayer is that prayer, even though God knows all things and God is sovereign, prayer changes things. And the biggest thing that prayer changes is us. The biggest thing that prayer changes is us. He says, they say right there, you know, is anyone, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And, is he, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The reason that I know that prayer changes us is because when Joe Lemons was an 11-year-old boy, and he was bullheaded and hardheaded. And, and my mom often said that God had to get a hold of me earlier. I would have wound up in jail. You know, that's, I guess that's prophetessness or something. I don't know. <laughs> she, she just knew because she was my mama. 
But when I was 11 years old, sitting in the very back of a sanctuary, not that different from this. I couldn't tell you a word the preacher said. That always encourages me as a pastor, you know, that I don't remember a word the preacher said that night that I got saved. All I know is that the conviction of the Holy Spirit was on my heart. Now let me tell you how I got to that church. I got to that church because I had a couple of, of, uh, a, a grand, a, a couple of grandparents and a great-grandmother who were concerned about the salvation of their family, of their grandkids, of their great-grandkids. As a matter of fact, uh, we had moved around a little bit, had stopped going to church, and, um, and my mom started meeting with some Jehovah's Witnesses, mainly because my mom was too nice to say no when they came to the door. And so she began to meet with them, and it scared my great-grandmother to death. My grandmother was a godly woman. She started going to this little church up in Tennessee where I grew up. It was right behind her house. And so she made it her mission to get her family in church. In addition to that, my dad's uh, father was a, was, a, was a separate Baptist preacher, hellfire and brimstone. First time I ever heard him preach, I looked over at my dad, and I said, what is he so mad about? <laughs> I'll tell you, um, when I was at First Baptist New Smyrna before I came here, I was an associate pastor, and one Sunday night I got to preach over there, and, and the other associate pastor, his son was in there because he had gotten in trouble in, in, in Awana and had to come sit with his dad in service. That was punishment to have to come sit and listen to me preach, I guess. But, uh, but anyways, at, at, uh, after the service, um, Wade, who if you ever, if you'd ever meet Wade Howell, he's a good, good friend, good fellow uh, pastor. Um, and, and Wade is very even keel. You know, he's just very calm, and, and, I, and I can be a little bit, dynamic sometimes I, sometimes I call myself a Baptocostal um, because I like to get a little a little fired up and and Wade showed me a note that he said these are the things David said to me while you were preaching and he pulled it down in the first one and said David leaned over to him and said he's going crazy <laughs> and then and he said a little bit later he leaned over and said this he's going super crazy <laughs> so I guess I just come by naturally from my from my grandfather who was a pastor but I'm telling you my grandfather and my grandmother who was a godly woman prayed for the salvation of their grandkids. And so I don't know what the preacher was preaching that night because it wasn't that important, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure it was important. I'm a preacher. It's important. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the, the work of the Holy Spirit that night. The work of the Holy Spirit was in my heart back there. I mean, the Holy Spirit was working through his sermon. I'm sure other people heard it. I just knew I was under conviction that entire service. I'd already heard the gospel before that, and I knew I needed to respond. And that Holy Spirit convicted my heart. And when that time of invitation uh, came, I, I couldn't hold back. I had to walk out and come down that aisle. And that night I prayed. And that prayer changed me. Because in that prayer, I received the salvation of God. I received the forgiveness of my sins. And the Holy Spirit took up residence inside Joe Lemons that night. Prayer changes things because it changed me. I pray that prayer has changed everyone in this room at some point in time in that way. That you have received the Holy Spirit in that. See, there is power in prayer. As a matter of fact, I would make the argument that prayer is the forgotten weapon when we talk about the armor of God. See, in Ephesians, when, when in chapter 6, when Paul begins to talk about the, the different parts of the armor of God, as a matter of fact, he says, you know, we need to stand. We need to take, do everything we can to stand and standing firm. And he says we need to stand firm with, you know, the, the helmet of, of, of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the, and the shield of faith and the shoes of readiness and the belt of truth and the sword, right, which we always talk about is the only, is the only offensive weapon um, uh, when, it, when it comes to that armor. Everything else is defensive, but that sword, which is the word of God, is the offensive weapon. And I believe strongly strongly in the word of God but then Paul doesn't stop he goes on and in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 he says praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplications for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak that's the forgotten weapon, if you ask me, of the armor of God, is it's prayer. There's a relatively new song by Phil Wickham, and it's called Battle Belongs. And it says, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. Amen? So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. The, song is, the understanding within the song is that the battle isn't ours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And so when we fight the battles that we face in this world, we're not the ones who are called to go out in combat. We're supposed to be on our knees because the Lord fights the battles for us. Amen? And so there's power in prayer as we seek God's face, as we ask the God of the universe to interact on our behalf, sometimes in the spiritual realm, sometimes in the physical realm, but asking the Spirit of the Creator of the universe 
Man, can, can you just imagine just like, like just the incredible, the incredible power, the incredible opportunity we have, right? So, so I'm, a, I'm a big fan of our governor, right? Now, you may not be, and that's okay, but I kind of like Ronnie D. And uh, I heard one day he was down at the Eagle Lake Diner. Did y'all know that? This has, been, this has been a number of months ago. Now, I eat at the Eagle Lake Diner, but I didn't eat at the Eagle Lake Diner that day. And if I know not eating there, just so I might have a chance to meet him. But then I thought, boy, if I'd met him, you know, you, you get a chance to talk to him. And maybe he'd be impressed with me. He gives me his phone number. I think a lot of myself sometimes, you know. And, uh, and I thought, boy, wouldn't that be cool if you could just say, like, something's going on. And you, well, let me just call the governor on that for you, right? You know, like, or, or maybe, maybe you wanted the phone of the president at some time where you said, well, let me just call the president and see what I can get worked out, you know, or different people who have different positions of authority, you know, and you think, boy, if I, boy, if I just had their phone number, if I had a relationship with them, I could impress people, or I could get something done, I, well, let me just call so-and-so, right? We, as believers in Jesus Christ, if you are saved, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and we have a direct line to the creator of the universe. Not the governor, not the president, not anybody with any kind of authority that we think is impressive here on this earth. We're talking about God, and we have access to the creator of the universe through prayer, and how often do we not take advantage of that? How often do we just do we just worry and we and we get all upset and we worry about a hurricane coming in instead of talking to the man who can move that hurricane at a moment's notice? And a God who even if he doesn't move that hurricane carries us through the storm. Amen. You know, because sometimes we pray and we think, well, God didn't answer our prayer. Well, no, he did. You know, I was uh I was preaching, as I said, through 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh, right? And we don't know exactly what that is. All we do know is that it was something that hindered Paul in his ministry. Uh, one of the most common thoughts is that it probably had something to do with his eyesight because he makes a reference in one of his other letters to the church about having something wrong with his eyes and that the church cared for him and that they would have even given him their, their eyes. I, I've even thought about it from the standpoint that, you know, I wear glasses, and in and, and Paul's day and age, you know, you, should, you couldn't just go to the eye doctor on the corner street. And, I mean, I don't even do that anymore. I just go online and order my glasses, right? I mean, 35 bucks if I break, I just order another pair, amen? I mean, that's just good testimony right there. But anyways, but let me tell you something. When I take these glasses off, I mean, I, I know who Jimmy is. He's a little blurry, but I know who he is. But, but beyond that, and, and I think there's people still back in that sound booth because I remember them being there, but they could, oh, he's moving a hand there. I know he's there, but that's about it. I wouldn't have a clue. Those words on the screen right up there, I couldn't see them. I and mean, I couldn't imagine having to live life like this. You know, like Paul might have had to if he, had, if he just had just normal eye problems like many of us have and need, and, and need eyes. I'm also getting to that point now where it's not just things that are far away or blurry, but things have to move back a little bit for me to be able to read. You know, I knew somebody told me it was downhill after 40. I just didn't realize how steep that curve was, you know. And so I don't, know, I don't know what Paul's exact ailment was, but here's what I do know. Paul said that he asked God three times to take that thorn out of his flesh. Asked him three times to remove it. This hindrance to the ministry as he saw it. Now, this is Paul, right? I mean, we ain't talking about Joe Lemons. All right? I can understand why God would say no to Joe Lemons. All right? We're talking about Paul. Paul raised people from the dead. We read that in Acts. Remember when uh, Paul must have been a boring preacher because that boy fell asleep and fell out the window while Paul was preaching. Fell to his death. What did Paul do? He prayed over him and brought him back to life. This is, this is, the, this is Paul. And he asked God to remove this thorn three times and, and what did God say? He said no. He said, my power is sufficient for you. Now do you think Paul had doubts when God said no to his prayers? No, because Paul learned to boast in his weakness, right? Because Paul understood that it had nothing to do with his power. He understood it wasn't any of his power that raised that boy from the dead. Paul learned to live by the power of the Holy Spirit that, that was inside of him, and he sought to live a life that brought glory and honor to God in everything that he did. I think that one of the most, one of the most uh, um, incredible prayers or one of the most things about prayer that I think I read in the Bible is in Romans chapter 10. If you go back and you read in, in Romans chapter 9, Paul is, is talking about his, his fellow Jewish people, you know, the people who were the descendants of Abraham, right, that he was a relative of. 
And so many of them had rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected that Jesus was the Lord. They were still, and there's, there are still Jewish people today looking for the Messiah to come. They don't believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah who was to come. And it burdened Paul's heart for, for his, his lost family, as he called them, for his lost people. I, I've often wondered, or I've often, I've often been challenged, that is my heart is burdened for the lost, as Paul's heart was burdened for the lost. Paul actually said, said in, in chapter 9 of Romans that if he, could, if he could give up his life for their salvation, he would do it. That's how, that's how burdened he was for the lost. But then at the beginning of chapter 10, Paul says this. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul set the example of praying for the salvation of the lost. And, and I'm going to tell you, we can pray about a lot of things, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things we can pray about. And, and, and biblically speaking, we can bring anything to God. There's nothing that's too small or too great that we can't, that we can't bring it to God. We can even pray out of our selfishness at times, and God knows who we are, and He just meets us right where we're at. Amen? Because God knows who Joe Lemons is, right? He, he's, he made him, He saved him, and He's still working on him. My wife could attest. That's why I don't let her come with me. No, I'm just joking. We got, we got five kids at home. so. <laughs> but, uh, but, but my wife could attest. God's still working on me, right? We can bring anything to the Lord. But God's Word says that, that, that the, the reason that we don't have is because we don't ask. And oftentimes the reason that we ask and don't get is because we ask with wrong motives. And we see throughout the New Testament that we're told if we pray in accordance with God's will, that God will answer those prayers. And so we can pray a lot of things. Like, I can pray about this storm, and I, and, and I have prayed about this storm. You know? And then I, I feel a little guilty because I'm like, Lord, would you let it shift this way? And then I think, well, man, that's just going to hit other people now, right? I mean, like, I mean it's going to hit somebody no matter what, right? And yet my prayer is, Lord, let it shift where it'll, it'll hurt the fewest people, as long as it's not me. No, I mean, you know, I mean, listen. I don't know what God's will is in this hurricane, where he wants it to go. It's going to go where it's going to go, and God knows. And God will work through it, and, and God's grace is sufficient for us. Amen? And, and l- l- let me just tell you all this really cool part, too. That if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and the worst of worst happens in the storm and you die, guess what? You won. I mean, right? Like, if we understand heaven, what do we want to do here? You know the saddest story in the Bible is the story of Lazarus? You know why? He is already in heaven. God called him back. To the Middle East with no air conditioning. That's like cruel and unusual punishment. No. I mean, heaven's where we want to go. So what do we have to fear? God's grace is sufficient for us, right? Because his power is made perfect in our weakness. But, but let me tell you a surefire prayer that you can pray that is in accordance with God's will. You ready for this? It's to pray for the lost. Because God's word says that God desires that none would perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, we also know that God's word is very clear that not everyone will. As a matter of fact, it says that that wide and well-worn is the path that leads to destruction. And narrow and and not often taken is the path that leads to salvation. And, And that's a passage that should motivate us. But at the end of the day, even though there is those who will not respond... We can pray knowing that it's God's will that none should perish. And so praying for the lost should be something that we could do easily and without question. Paul set the example. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Is that they may be saved. Because Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And at the end of the day, if we're going to commit our prayer life to any one thing, I think it's that we could commit our prayer life to, the, to, to praying for the lost, for them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, especially as we see the day approaching. I don't know about you, but I look out at this world and I think the end is near. Now, that end could be 100 years from now. It could be 200 years from now. It could be tomorrow. God only knows. But at the end of the day, what I do know is that God says it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. And when people die separated from Jesus Christ, they spend an eternity in hell because of their sin. And see, God, or or Paul tells us in Romans, uh, a little bit later in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, that's good news right there, isn't it? That's good news. It says if you confess with your mouth. That sounds like prayer to me. 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because in Romans 10, 13, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a message to us. And while I believe wholeheartedly that we are called to go and to share that good news, with every opportunity that we have, with the circle of influence that each one of us that God has given, we need to be sharing that good news. But let me tell you what we need to do before we go and share, is we need to pray. Because the Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless the, Father, unless the Spirit draws them to the Father. And so we need to pray for those who are lost. Pray for those who are far away. Pray that God would speak to their heart, that the Holy Spirit would draw them to salvation. Because my God is a great God. My God is a God who can do anything and all things. And my God is a God who will never leave us or forsake us. And while He might not always carry the storm around us, He'll always carry us through the storm. Amen? Well, that, that's a, you know, I've used that, that, that expression many times when there's a hurricane coming, it takes on new meaning, doesn't it? But that our God will carry us through the storm. Because His grace is sufficient. Because His power is made perfect in our weakness. Paul, or James ends that, that passage that we read there with, with referencing Elijah. A man with a nature like ours, right? You know what that means? It means he was a sinner too. Everybody you read about in the Bible was a sinner. Sometimes I like to go and read those stories because it makes me feel like maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was, or at least I'm in good company, right? Amen? But Elijah was a man just like us, a man with a nature just like ours, and yet he prayed earnestly and it didn't rain for, what, three years? and Firmly, it would not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You know, God can work miracles through faithful prayer. God can, God can heal people from diseases. God can change the path of hurricanes. But bigger than all that, is that through the power of prayer, God's Holy Spirit can draw someone into a life, eternity-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And is that not the most important? Is that not the most important? You know, I, uh, and I'll wrap up with this. I've probably gone too long. I wasn't looking at the clock. I apologize. But let me just tell you this. After Irma, that, that's, the, that's the first hurricane I lived through here in Winter Haven. It was, it was Irma that came through, and that was a few years back. Um, we were without power for a solid week. Like, like in our house, like in, and at one point all our neighbors got power, and our one house is on the grid that goes behind, and that one wasn't there yet. So everybody else had power except us. People brought us generators. Like, oh, we don't need this anymore. Here you go. You can borrow it. Oh, thanks. Solid week without power. You know what that means? No air conditioning. Now, maybe that's not important to you, but I'm a sweater, okay? I mean, I like my AC, okay? I had to go a week with no air conditioning, with no power. Couldn't take a hot shower. I stunk most of that week. I, I ran into some church folks. At, at a, we'd gone out to eat at, at Chick-fil-A, and I was embarrassed to go talk to them because I'm pretty sure I smelled uh, because it had just been hot, and I was sweating, and I couldn't even take a, a, a good shower, you know? And, man, and, and let me tell you, oftentimes I think back on that, and I think, like with this storm, I think, oh, I, just, I don't I don't want to lose power for a week. Lord, Lord, please, don't let me lose power for a week. And listen, we can pray that prayer to God. But how much more important is it to pray for those who are in the path of this storm who could very well lose their lives and may not know Jesus Christ, which means that their eternity is a whole lot worse than a week without air conditioning. There's a world of people out there who need Jesus. Let's tap into the power that God has given us to talk to the creator of the universe. Let's make prayer a priority within our lives and see the power of God work through that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you right now and I thank you, Lord, that you are God in heaven and that there is no other. Lord, I thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords and you are the only one who is worthy of our attention, of our focus. Lord, you are the only one who is worthy of us giving our lives to. 
because you laid down your life for us. Lord, I thank you for these brothers and sisters in Christ who came out on a, on a Tuesday night before a storm's coming in, but were faithfully here because they believe in you and they believe in prayer and they believe in the power that prayer has. Lord, I pray that you would bless that faithfulness. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have its way in this place as we continue this worship. Lord, as we continue to worship you, spending time in prayer, seeking your face. And Lord, I pray for the lost. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you. Lord, especially those who are in the path of this storm. Those who may face death and don't know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that gives us the hope to face the difficult times because of the power of Jesus Christ living in us and the hope of salvation. And so Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would draw them to salvation. Lord, I pray that through something as devastating as a hurricane, Lord, that your power would be made known and that the lost would come to know you as Savior and Lord, because your people are being the hands and feet of Jesus to share the good news of a God who loves us. Lord, have your way in this place. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.